Uh, look, this is going to be a bit heavy, so my apologies for that um, <laughs> at this hour of the morning. Uh, uh, and, and look, honestly, there's a lot swimming around in my head that is not in this paper, and I'm not going to um, address unless somebody wants to pick me up on, on one of the points and, and pursue something uh, in more detail. Th this paper that I'm presenting is really uh, an economist's paper. Having said that, um, I don't think few economists would bother to write it. <laughs> uh, and we may ponder why that is the case. Uh, let, let's get straight into it. According to the Chicago economist, uh, Milton Friedman, whose name has been bandied around a lot in Australia in recent years, uh, and I'll quote, there's one and only one social responsibility of business to use its resources and engage in activities designed to increase its profits so long as it stays within the rules of the game, which is to say, engages in free and open competition without deception or fraud, unquote. Well, that statement appears in Friedman's celebrated book, Capitalism and Freedom, the 40th edition of which was published in 2002. I first became aware of uh, this book. I read the 20th edition when I was a young PhD student. Friedman's articulation of the social responsibility in a capitalist system has always been uh, controversial, but actually it's not considered by economists to be in any way idiosyncratic. Um, and it is it, it accords with a framework that I would say most economic policy makers in the United States, the UK, Canada, uh, Australia and New Zealand carry around in their heads, um, uh, including to this day. In considering the social responsibility of business in the 21st century, I'm going to use Friedman's treatise as my frame of reference. What I want to do is to explain the thinking behind Friedman's exposition of capitalism, then explain why things are not, not working as anticipated and conclude with some comments on what appears to be replacing it. Friedman's statement of social responsibility of business in the capitalist system. It's, it's not a mere political assertion nor a naked um, a priori statement. It's a carefully constructed proposition drawn directly from a, a highly formalized neoclassical model of economics. Several of the pioneers of neoclassical economics were absorbed with the following very big question. Um, what is the least restrictive set of assumptions necessary to ensure that market outcomes are Pareto optimal. That means that the outcomes are such that no person could be made better off without at least one other person being made worse off. That's what characterizes Pareto optimality. And the answer to that question establishes what we grandiose economists refer to as the first fundamental theorem of welfare economics. And it goes like this. If every business seeks merely to maximize profit, and if every consumer seeks selfishly to maximize his and her individual utility, then markets characterized by free and open competition will collectively deliver Pareto optimality, provided, and it's a big proviso, there are no externalities or other instances of market failure. There's a lot in that theorem. This theorem provides the moral support for free market capitalism. It's constructed purely on efficiency grounds. It's a moral case that's concerned only with the size of the pie, it has no regard to the distribution of the pie amongst citizens. And as you would have noticed, the support is heavily qualified Importantly, Pareto optimality cannot be claimed if markets are not competitive, nor can it be claimed if there are externalities or any other instances of market failures. When markets are not competitive, customers pay prices that are higher than necessary. And of course, many markets are not competitive. Even in highly competitive markets, customers are being tricked or scammed every minute of every day by deception or fraud. How many times do you confront somebody trying to scam you on your mobile phone? Sometimes this is because customers or consumers are poorly informed, victims of a type of market failure labelled information asymmetry. Their stories provide salacious material for the media and for royal commissions. 
politicians, regulators and commentators decry business cultures that lack customer centricity. And customer centricity is a rather important thing, but even a business with a perfect customer conduct record can be a social monster. Consider a business that produces goods cheaply for its customers by exploiting child labor or by slavery. So an accounting of the social contribution of business therefore must include the interests of workers and suppliers, as well as shareholders and customers. Shareholders, workers, suppliers, and customers together might be described as a set of stakeholders associated with the entity. But even that fails to provide the full picture. A business could have very happy shareholders, customers, workers, and suppliers, and still be a social monster because of what Friedman described in Capitalism and Freedom as neighborhood effects. Today, we would label these things ne negative externalities. So for example, consider the slaughter of African elephants to satisfy consumer demand for ivory or the plunder of Australian native forests to satisfy the Japanese consumer's demand for paper and the European market for so-called zero emissions solid fuels. Or the use of greenhouse gas emitting fossil fuels to produce cheap electricity for today's uh, households. We can assume that the pursuit of profit motivates all of these activities. None of them evidences an absence of consumer centricity and all have been promoted often strenuously and in some cases even today based on their contribution to the livelihoods of workers and suppliers. For good reason, businesses generating negative externalities have attracted the interest of stakeholders who are not associated with the entity. With all this stakeholder interest in the conduct of every business, how on earth could economic policymakers framing the laws affecting business conduct ever have come to the view that business should not have any social responsibility beyond profit. If business is to concern itself with nothing beyond profit, whose responsibility is it to ensure that the heavy qualifications on the moral legitimacy of capitalism are addressed? First, whose responsibility is it to ensure that business stays within what Friedman calls the rules of the game? Well, clearly it's in our interest as consumers, workers and suppliers that businesses don't rip us off. But in Capitalism and Freedom, Friedman goes further explaining that in a democracy, it is our responsibility as citizens to ensure that business cannot do so. Thus, as consumers, we shouldn't entirely have to look after ourselves as would be implied by a strict application of the principle of caveat emptor. Instead, it's our responsibility as citizens to use our democratic system of government. In Friedman's words, and I'll quote again, to establish a framework of law to determine, arbitrate and enforce the rules of the game. It's the social responsibility of the rest of us as citizens, not the responsibility of business to ensure free and open competition and to guard against deception or fraud. Now, it's trite to observe that the limited moral legitimacy of the capitalist system rests on unrealistic assumptions. That observation, whilst true, takes us nowhere. The task of economic policy, on the other hand, is to render those assumptions realistic. And it's our responsibility as citizens to elect parliamentarians who will implement such policies and fund their enforcement. So capitalism positions business and the rest of us not as comrades sharing common or even convergent interests, but rather as adversaries. And it positions democratically elected government as our gladiator. This is why we have the various regulatory agencies of government focused on business conduct, including the ACCC, ASIC, Offices of Fair Trading, Food Standards Australia New Zealand, and the Fair Work Commission, and many others. The policy issues entrusted to these regulatory agencies include abuse of market power and market failures due to persistent information asymmetries that would permit fraud or deception. What then of the interests of stakeholders not associated with the entity, but nevertheless affected by its operations? That is, what of externalities? And what are the distributional implications of the entity's commercial activities? Well, 
In Capitalism and Freedom, Friedman does not dismiss these interests. He identifies a general case for the rest of us addressing these matters through the agency of government, though with limits. He cautions that government activity itself is likely to generate negative externalities. For that reason, he recommends a balance sheet approach. And I'll quote again, listing separately the advantages and disadvantages in any particular case of proposed intervention. Well, today we would refer to this as a cost benefit methodology. It's important to appreciate that so a few, few people seem to, that this is a constituent component of the capitalist model. So Friedman's capitalism is very clear on the matters of roles, on the matter of roles and responsibilities. Business should not have responsibility for anything beyond profit. Everything else is up to the rest of us. Friedman's concern is that if business is obliged to accept responsibility for social outcomes beyond profit, then we will find ourselves on a slippery slope to socialism or something worse. In Capitalism and Freedom, he proffers that it's hard to argue that a business person in a competitive market has any social responsibility except that which is shared by all citizens to obey the law of the land and to live according to his lights. I was quoting again. But what about a monopolist who, in maximising profit, necessarily extracts surplus value from consumers? Well, in considering the case for a monopolist being expected to pursue some socially desirable ends, Friedman quickly concludes that, and I'll quote again, the widespread application of such a doctrine would destroy a free society, unquote. Well, in insisting that a monopolist should have no social responsibility beyond profit, Friedman can not draw moral support from the theoretical infrastructure that underpins Pareto optimality, because that rests on perfectly competitive markets. But he replaces those constructs with something perhaps even more impressive. He now relies upon the moral supports of political freedom. I'm not sure I've got him right here, but as I understand it, his reasoning is as follows. It's the role of the rest of us to use the, tool, the tools of democratic government to ensure that markets are competitive. If we fail to do so, that is, if we allow monopolies to operate, then that's a poor, but nevertheless a legitimate outcome of the democratic process. In the, in the interests of freedom, democracy should not be subverted by calls from any stakeholder for a monopolist to address himself or herself to any particular social purpose beyond adherence to the laws of the land. Well, Friedman's 1962 treatise does more than articulate how the capitalist model should look. According to its author, its major theme is an explanation of the foundational role of free market capitalism in supporting liberalism. Friedman contends that competitive capitalism is both a system of economic freedom and a necessary condition for political freedom. Yet he also emphasizes that the capitalist model doesn't work without effective government. And this poses a challenge for liberals since government is not a natural friend of liberalism. That's obviously true of totalitarian models of governments and governance, but it's also been demonstrated on numerous occasions by most parliamentary democracies around the world, including here in Australia. Think of post-war protectionism, for example. In the introduction to capitalism and freedom, Friedman explains the challenge in these terms. How can we keep the government we create from becoming a Frankenstein that will destroy the very freedom we establish it to protect? This question exposes the minor theme of Friedman's book, which is the appropriate role of government. And of course, the framing of the question, the way that Friedman chooses to frame it, provides a clue that Friedman, his concern is not that government will do too little, but rather that it'll do too much. Capitalism's allocation of social responsibilities establishes democratic government as a foundational partner of Western capitalism but it's an adversarial, distrusting partnering of liberal markets and liberal political institutions. Making that sort of partnership work was always going to demand a challenging level of economic literacy underpinned by knowledgeable and responsible media 
and politicians motivated to act responsibly with discipline and finesse. And I have to say, reflecting on 28 years of public policy advising in Australia, I would doubt that we ever had a sufficiency of any of those things. In any event, all have decayed rapidly over the past couple of decades. The core premise of Western capitalism is that the rest of us as citizens will be capable of using our political freedom through the agency of representative democracy to secure social progress in a world in which business has no responsibility beyond the pursuit of profit. But political freedom doesn't guarantee effective government. Friedman might have wondered at the consequences of the rest of us proving incapable of using our political freedoms to secure a government that's capable of protecting economic freedoms. In particular, a government that is capable of dealing effectively with the various market failures that both obviate Pareto optimality and undermine community support for capitalism. Well, it wasn't until the 40th anniversary edition of Capitalism and Freedom that Friedman acknowledges the mistake. Reflecting on 40 years of political and economic history, he writes that, quote, the one major defect in the book seems to me an inadequate treatment of the role of political freedom, which under some circumstances promotes economic and civic freedom and under others inhibits economic and civic freedom, unquote. But even in making this concession, Friedman continues to take political function for granted. Democracy might work to promote economic and civic freedom, or it might inhibit both, but it will nevertheless function. Well, I would suggest that 20 years later, he might have found cause to worry about the implications of political dysfunction. Political dysfunction matters. If the democratic political system has become dysfunctional, then the core premise of capitalism is false. The whole capitalist construct lacks legitimacy. If democracy has a problem, then capitalism has a bigger problem. Well, most of us have more than a sense that something isn't working here. With good reason, most of us point the finger at the people we elect to parliament. There's plenty of survey evidence that most Australians consider that government cannot be trusted to do the right thing. More than two fifths appear to recognize that this implies that there's something wrong with the functioning of democracy itself. This is a problem for Friedman's capitalism. When trust in government is that low, there's likely to be only a low level of community comfort with the notion that business should have no social responsibility beyond profit. And that is exactly how it's playing out around the world what many people are describing as a crisis in capitalism would more accurately be labelled a crisis of democracy. Today, the rest of us view our gladiator, the government, who's meant to look after our interests as being distracted, incompetent, narcissistic, even corrupt, preferring to fight battles with others who, like them, appear to crave only the glow of the arena. Our politicians seek merely to entertain us, knowing that every act in their 24 seven reality TV show will, will be accompanied by a swamp of media commentary. Do they care whether this commentary is positive or negative? At least it's about them. Dysfunctional government means that the rest of us place a low level of trust in businesses that have no social goal beyond profit. Consider how the rest of us, that is all of us, process the following set of failures. The failure to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions, the failure to protect environmental amenity and preserve habitat for threatened species and for the enjoyment of future generations, the failure to ensure the humane treatment of animals used to feed and clothe us, including animal cruelty associated with live sheep exports to the Middle East, live cattle exports to our northern neighbours and factory farming. Elevated levels of job and income insecurity associated with casualization, automation, and robotics. And offshoring. The failure to deliver a fair distribution of income and wealth. Low wages growth other than for senior executives. Gender inequity in employment, promotion, and remuneration. 
uh, oh, the offshoring of jobs in customer service call centres and other things, so groundwater contamination and the destruction of agricultural land due to fracking, farm runoff and other pollutants affecting the Great Barrier Reef, the destruction of wildlife habitat through land clearing, the logging of native forests and ghost nets in our oceans, proposals to open new coal mines in prime agricultural country, unsustainable water use in the Murray-Darling Basin, alleged underpayment by supermarket chains for farm produce, an epidemic of obesity and diabetes due to the marketing of fast foods and products saturated with sugar, and the human misery associated with irresponsible gambling, tobacco and alcoholism. All these identify instances of government failure, but the problem for business is that it's their activities that have generated these failures. And they derive no protection from proclaiming that they operate in a capitalist system that insists they should not have any responsibility to behave otherwise. The community has reason to expect a lot of business. Business makes choices that affect the lives of all citizens. We see businesses deciding who gets a job, how much they're paid and where they work. We see businesses deciding what's produced, how it's produced, and the way it is offered to consumers. Collectively, those decisions taken by business largely determine the distribution of income and wealth, even as between successive generations. And business decisions also determine the pattern and the pace of the degradation of the natural environment. Not all shareholders are content with the proposition that business should have no social purpose beyond profit. In recent decades, shareholder activism, by which is meant shareholders insisting that companies take an interest in various matters beyond profit, has become pretty much ubiquitous. And because the term refers to shareholders and capitalism contains a notion of shareholder supremacy, there might be a temptation to think that shareholder activism is a natural part of the capitalist model. It's not. Friedman's articulation of the social responsibility of business makes it clear that a company should take no interest in any shareholder concern that extends beyond profit. But it's not only shareholders who take an interest in the non-financial affairs of companies. Today, the rest of us, that is, each and every one of us, identify as stakeholders of many companies. We refer <clears throat> to the sum of stakeholder concerns as community expectations, establishing community standards, our interests in corporate behaviour go well beyond concerns about competitiveness, fraud or deception. And we're not content to rely upon persuading what we perceive to be a dysfunctional parliament to legislate in our interests. We will make our case to content hungry commentators, to proxy advisors and institutional shareholders. We will orchestrate social media campaigns, and we will enlist populist politicians to our cause. Our activities have attracted the label stakeholder capitalism. Well, the expression stakeholder capitalism is obviously, given what I've said, an oxymoron. The risk is that it's merely an expression of populism. But on the other hand, on the other hand, like many oxymor oxymorons, it seeks a bold repositioning with those who advance the concept illustrating the many ways in which capitalism has failed to meet community expectations and outlining what business might need to do differently to rebuild trust. From a business perspective, governments have been behaving increasingly like just another disaffected external stakeholder. Not as the body responsible for the rules of the game, nor even the body responsible for ensuring the adequate resourcing of regulation but rather as a low-grade commentator, one angry voice among many angry voices in a mob of business bashers, frequently pointing an accusatory finger at a business person who has failed the pub test. Since no act above some level of imbecilic populism can be guaranteed to pass the pub test, at least thinking about the pubs that I frequent, all people in business in Australia find themselves in a precarious position. Denied the clarity afforded by functional democracy, they're being told that they must meet community expectations. To an unsophisticated audience, that won't seem unreasonable, 
but consider what it really means. It means being accountable for balancing the constantly changing and competing demands of millions of stakeholders. The capitalist model insists that this is the peculiar responsibility of democratically elected officials. That is, it's the peculiar responsibility of government. But today, in a radical reframing of roles and responsibilities, those democratically elected officials are insisting that, is, that it is the responsibility of business. The uncomfortable territory in which business leaders now find themselves is a long way from the place described by Milton Friedman. It's time to be asking whether business can save itself. Some of Australia's business leaders see no need for business to change anything. For them, the social purpose of business remains simply to pursue profit. They consider it entirely appropriate that customers, workers and suppliers are treated merely as the instruments, the means with which that goal is pursued. If negative externalities like greenhouse gas emissions, for example, are lawful, then they should be ignored. The support of the community in which the business operates or currently operates matters only to the extent that the reputation of the business affects its profitability. Well, that's one perspective. I would suggest that that perspective underestimates the risks posed by political dysfunction. For those who provide governance of the nation's businesses, there's a rather prosaic reason for thinking more broadly about the notion of corporate accountability. Today, they should be feeling the weight of expectation from multiple stakeholders. The community expects that directors will be accountable to and not merely take into account those multiple stakeholders, even if there's no legal obligation to do so. Community expectations are amplified by combative politicians and poisonous media commentary. Every day, the Australian press carries an allegation of a company director or a group of directors having failed the pub test, being tone deaf or having a tin ear. Shareholders and proxy advisors, they read this stuff and they're influenced by it. So how might business leaders respond? In recent years, some analysts, an increasing number of shareholder activists, a few quality commentators and an expanding set of business leaders have come to the view that if capitalism is going to work in today's world, the renovation will have to come from the inside from business. There's growing acceptance of the proposition that if business is going to be trusted by stakeholders other than shareholders, and even by shareholders, then it's going to have to assume some accountability for interests beyond profit. And in my view, business is going to have to accept accountability for all of the consequences of its activities, both good and bad. This goes well beyond accepting accountability for the treatment of customers and suppliers and the welfare of workers. Some businesses have gone beyond questions of accountability. They've stepped right outside of the capitalist model and embraced an inclusive social purpose beyond profit. For this group of leaders, the shareholder, no less than the customer or the worker, plays an instrumental role in the pursuit of a meaningful social impact. The challenge facing Australian capitalism, due largely to dysfunction in our democratic institutions, demands much more of our business leaders. There was a time when a business leader could rely upon the nation's political leaders to make the case for and underwrite community confidence in a free market capitalist economy, albeit with important elements of government intervention. A time has passed, at least for the present. Today, the task of making the case for business falls to business itself. Business leaders could start by articulating a clear statement of their business's reason for existence, the impact they intend to have on people's lives, and how, with the support of shareholder capital and through the agency of both their workforce and their customers, their business seeks to contribute not only to customer and employee well-being, but also to the building of strong communities and a fair and vibrant nation, and then they should deliver. This won't save Friedman's capitalism, and neither will it improve the functioning of democracy, but it might save business. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I want to start by Thanking Dr. Henry for his very thought provoking presentation. I think it provides a really wonderful framing for the issues 
for the conference. Um, I also just wanted to thank and congratulate the organisers for the quality of the program and the speakers that you've put together for the next two days and for the extraordinary stamina to get, to get it across the line. Um, I did just want to echo Professor Gilding's comments about the difficulties of doing Australian social science research within the university system in Australia. And perhaps we feel it most acutely because uh, like him, I'm a professor in a business school and um, the pressures in terms of the way we recognise and reward academic research make it very difficult. It's exacerbated by what's happened to the university sector over the last two years, but it certainly predates that. And I often talk about the abolition of the chair in um, Australian literature at the University of Sydney, Dame Leone Kramer's old chair as sort of the beginning of the end. Anyway, I'm on Gadigal land here in Sydney at the moment, so I just wanted to acknowledge um, the traditional owners of the land that I'm located on at the moment. I'm going to just speak for five or ten minutes um, to some of Dr Henry's key observations and challenges and really to concentrate on what he has described as um, Milton Freeman's minor theme, which is about the need for there to be a constructive relationship between government and business and how when we come into the point of the cycle where we've got difficulties with the business half of that equation, it puts pressure on the model. I want to start with, just to put you in the frame of mind, I, I want to start with the kind of cliched um, image of business as being like a train. So if you think about the job of the business corporation, it's being to bring together human and financial capital uh, and to build the best, most efficient train to get to the destination as quickly as possible. Uh, and we can call that destination shareholder wealth over the medium to long term. Um, the Freeman model very much assumes that we'll get the best outcome from getting that train uh, running if there's a dynamic tension between business and government. Um, business's job in the Friedman model is to go hell for leather, like a bullet train towards that profit destination and keeping that very uh, clear focus. And the job of government is really to lay out the tracks and to build the guardrails. And if you're Victorian, level crossings, they don't have level crossings anywhere else, people in Melbourne. But um, so the idea of the sort of relationship between government setting the path and, and setting the things that protect the people who um, through whose community that that train is running. Of course, the difficulty, as Dr. Henry points out, is that if government drops the ball, which it does periodically, um, I know it feels like every time it happens it's the first time, but it does happen periodically, uh, then all that the community tends to see is a careening train wrecking everything and running through and spewing out pollution and so on. Um, and indeed, as Dr. Henry makes the point, um, at the moment, they're actually being whipped up and encouraged by populist politicians to see um, exactly that result. So we're at a point where we've got two choices. We can either blow up the train, so get rid of the for-profit business corporation, or we can get some people in the driver's seat who are capable of getting it to the destination that we want to get to, um, while at the same time sort of running around and trying to lay track as they're, as they're rolling along. All right, so hold that image of the train in your mind and, uh, and we'll come back to it. So uh, Dr Henry said that he made the point that political dysfunction matters and he said that if the democratic political system has become dysfunctional, then the core premise of Friedman's capitalism is false. The whole capitalist construct lacks legitimacy. If democracy has a problem, then capitalism has a bigger problem. Um, he goes on to say that when trust in government is low, there is likely to be a low level of community comfort with the notion that a business should have no responsibility beyond profit and that that's really the debate that's playing out at the moment. So I just want to pull out from that observation that we're at a point where maybe the difficulties that we're having with the government half of that balance are producing these um, problems in the corporate or the business half. And I think 
that creates three really profound challenges and they really resonate with the themes of the conference and they relate to three things. The first is the purpose of the business corporation. The second is the governance of the business corporation. And the third is the accountability of the people who are charged with the responsibility of, um, of operating the business corporation. So the first problem that we find ourselves confronted with in this new world is, well, who's the arbiter of what we, that is the rest of us, want? Um, if who gets to decide, is it, do we leave it to business leaders to decide the direction, the ultimate destination, if you like, um, that we all should be pulling towards? And if we are leaving it to them, well, what's the source of their legitimacy? I mean, of course, in, when that's the job of government, then its legitimacy and its right to make those decisions uh, comes from the democratic process and they're accountable ultimately to um, the electorate at least once every three or four years, uh, we get to have a say. But that's not the case. Once you take that job of being the arbiter of what, what we want away from people who have that democratic legitimacy, what are we left with? And I think there's a concern at the moment that we're left with pub tests, community expectations, community standards, uh, things like that. So who's really driving the debate? Who's making that decision? Um, should we make those, should we trust those people more than we trust politicians? Um, are we leaving it to financier stakeholders um, like institutional investors and providers of credit like banks and, and insurance companies, which we certainly saw coming to the fore in Glasgow um, in terms of uh, making decisions about the allocation of financial support? Is it other contractual stakeholders? We get to decide that. So is it employees, customers, suppliers, uh, and so on? Or is it a kind of broader non-contractual stakeholders, the community um, posterity I've written about, uh, or some other idea of, of who gets to decide um, what the purpose of the corporation should be? I think that the issue is even more complicated by the fact that uh, we can talk about what the purpose of the business corporation is in terms of its own um, economic mandate, and I mean on a company-by-company -company basis. So you could say, well, Qantas's job is to work out how to be an airline. Um, but the other phenomenon that I think we've seen or that I've observed over the last five or so years in particular is that as government has withdrawn from or had reduced capacity to deal with broader social problems that transcend individual business operations, uh, there's an increased expectation that um, business leaders or that companies are going to rush in and solve that problem. And you certainly, uh, Qantas is a great example. So in the um, marriage equality debate, Qantas obviously came out very strongly on that issue as a company and that caused consternation in parts of the community about whether that was some, you know, the role of business or whether they ought to, as I think the current government thinks, ought to sit, stick to their knitting and stay out of, uh, you know, social issues. Um, so we're, this question about who gets to decide what business is for and what goal it ought to pursue is a very profound issue at the moment. And um, I think that debate is really important. I know Professor Mayer will have something to say about that tonight. The project at the British Academy has produced this definition of the purpose of the business corporation or of, of business as being to produce profitable solutions for the problems of people and planet, not profiting from creating problems as an expression of the purpose of the business corporation. So who gets to decide that and what is it? Um, I think we're going to see over the next year a bit of backlash against the, um, the sort of business roundtable in the US approach. We're already seeing some literature that stakeholder capitalism is a false dawn and it's all just an exercise in greenwashing and inauthenticity is worse than rapacious behaviour and so on. So I think that's a debate that's going to continue to play out and I, and I imagine we will spend some time on it 
on the next two days. So the second issue that, that Dr Henry's comments raise for us is, if we, assuming we could agree on the goal of the perforate, the goal of the corporation, so the purpose of the corporation, are we then creating this problem where we're expecting business leaders to uh, reconcile or respond to competing demands? So Dr Henry said um, about this uh, idea of meeting community expectations. He said, consider what this really means. Be accountable for balancing the constant changing and competing demands of millions of stakeholders. The capitalist model insists that this is a peculiar responsibility for democratically elected officials, that is the government. But today, in a radical reframing of roles and responsibilities, both democratically elected officials are insisting that it's the responsibility of business. So when you talk to business leaders about the need to take into account interests of stakeholders beyond financier stakeholders, so beyond shareholders and other providers of capital, you do kind of get this sense that, well, you know, then, but how do we then pick between them? And I think um, I've often said that that's the role of the board. That's why we have a board um, in order to mediate that complex issue. And I sometimes say to directors, it's like being the administrator or the executor of your father's will when he's remarried and had a second family. It's never fun, no one's going to agree, but the job is like a trustee that is serving the interests of beneficiaries that don't always line up. It's the responsibility of, of the business leaders to engage in that balancing. And that's why I, I mentioned this because it relates to the question of governance. So are we getting the right people in the right place to make those decisions? Are we incentivizing and rewarding them properly? Have, are we making it possible for them to manage non-financial risk in the right way, to create a culture that binds the activities of the corporation to its purpose and so on? And I think that that's made more difficult by very bad quality regulation, of which we have far too much in the financial sector. And Justice Derrington, no doubt, will speak to that later in the conference. Um, it also, this issue about governance, it opens up the question of, well, you know, how do you, how do you make sure that you are uh, understanding the interests of stakeholders, that you're able to cut through the noise? And I think the, you know, broader issues about two-tier boards, representative boards, annual elections for directors and so on, they all touch on that issue of how do we make sure that the balancing is being done by people who are um, in a position to cut through the political noise, the media noise uh, and the pub test and so on and actually arrive at a reasoned basis to do that. And then the third problem, of course, is the problem of accountability. So once you've worked out what the purpose is and once you've got the right people in place uh, to balance up the various interests that we expect them to balance, how do we make sure that they're properly accountable? And I'm very interested, as you know, in the accountability of directors and managers. And I always say that I think we mustn't lose sight of the fact that this does require a, an intelligent combination of legal liability, commercial accountability and moral responsibility. Those three things are always intertwined and I think we have to resist the temptation as legal scholars to jump to a solution that says, well, we'll just, you know, have more bear, have more far, have more heads on sticks and so on. And I'm going to speak to that tomorrow as well. Um, we, we will see this continue to play out. So the state of the law in Australia at the moment is that corporate leaders may take into account stakeholder interests, but they're not obliged to under our legislation. Uh, we've just seen in New Zealand, the Institute of Directors, so the equivalent of our AICD, has put out a discussion paper about whether New Zealand law ought to mandate that boards of companies in New Zealand take into account a broader range of stakeholder interests than just um, the interests of shareholders. I'm not sure that they are allowed or required to just take into account the interests of shareholders at the moment, but that debate is certainly playing out. Um, I, I'm very pleased to see that we have Professor Redmond um, attending and I've just written my magazine column for next year and uh, I put in it a quote from Professor Redmond 
from 2005, he may recall his submission on corporate social responsibility, where he raised exactly this issue. And he said, the goals of corporate social responsibility as the voluntary assumption of higher standards of corporate conduct are laudable, but are no substitute for legal regulation to protect vulnerable interests or achieve wider social goals or legal norms to express or shape corporate purpose. Uh, that's 16 years ago, so there you go. Good quality scholarship will always out.